It's really a pleasure to be here, and I thank you for the invitation. I thank your two leaders. I think it says something uh, about uh, America and about Boston College um, that the two of you and your organizations have uh, um, allowed me to share uh, a few minutes uh, with you to talk a little bit about one of the most uh, controversial and tense issues facing uh, America and American families. And it's one we're all navigating through uh, carefully, sometimes with heated rhetoric, but in the end, I think we are making great progress. It's also really nice to be on this campus again. Um, I am a graduate of Boston College High School, and after seeing how young I looked when I first was elected and knowing Max graduated in 2002 and I gra graduated from in 1986 from Boston College High School, I'm feeling particularly old tonight. So despite that, it is good to be in your company. I remember actually uh, my first, one of my first days on campus, I had the privilege of being the Tip O'Neill uh, Scholar uh, here on campus in graduate studies. And the, the uh, professor in the Tip O'Neill program was William Schneider, the leading analyst on uh, CNN. He taught me a lot about presidential elections because I was here in 1992 and his teaching assistant. And I remember uh, one of the first days I had the privilege of, be, of uh, being sent over to the Tip O'Neill Library in one of the last years that Tip O'Neill himself was alive. And they asked me if I would sit down and have lunch with the speaker. And of course, I was nervous as heck. I went over and sat down next to the speaker. And, and he uh, shook my hand and said, Mr. Greer, it's a real pleasure to have you uh, as a part of this program. And great to spend a minute with you at lunch. He said, um, if you're, a, you're a Catholic. You're the son of an Italian immigrant. Um, where the hell did you go wrong? How the hell did you become a Republican? And uh, I knew then that my life being a Republican from Massachusetts would be an interesting one. And I got scolded from one of the great uh, Democrats this nation has ever seen and a person who certainly loved uh, Boston College. I've been in the midst of a, a nationwide tour. I've been to 29 states and, as of yesterday now, 98 cities having a dialogue with Republican leaders, some in public, some privately, meeting with college Republican organizations and LGBT groups, and really trying to get a sense as I travel the nation of where the hearts and minds of the American people are, of all ages, um, of all perspectives, or all, of all party persuasions, in an attempt to, in the midst of this very, very tense dialogue, see if we can find as a nation a welcome home for all Americans, regardless of sexual orientation. It's a, it's a great challenge during a very challenging time. I have to say, not only is it good to be here because I recognize the place and I care a lot about Boston College, uh, but I've been to some really odd places that were less inviting and less welcoming. Um, and so it's good to be here in that spirit. I, was, uh, I usually fake I don't know where I am when a, dri when a person who drives me to campus and I say, tell me a couple things that I don't know about Boston College or should know as a visitor. And so tonight, and a gentleman said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Log Cabin Republicans. And he said, you should know two things about Boston College. And he described play by play um, the great uh, Flutie to Carol Phelan pass um, years ago, which, of course, I knew every single moment of that play and watched it. Um, and second, he told me how really attractive the women were on campus, <laughs> which led me to really know he had no idea what the Log Cabin Republicans were. <laughs> And I thanked him for that great advice and told him I would look on campus for the women that he had just described. Um, and it reminded me, quite frankly, of uh, my last visit to a couple weeks ago. I was on the University of Chicago campus. And they had set up this very, very heated debate. It was myself against someone who was um, proud to be from the very far right in America. And uh, in his opening remarks, he announced that all gay men have at least 1,032 sexual partners in their lifetime, at which point I started crying in my seat because I've had such a pathetic social life. I couldn't believe <laughs> this man was announcing this. Uh, but that's how the debate started, and you can imagine where the debate went from there um, in terms of the kind of rhetoric and misinformation and stereotypes that sometimes exist, even in um, important campuses like the University of Chicago. Thankfully, this person was not a professor at the university. Uh, but he certainly did make a powerful case and reminded me a lot about why I am traveling the nation, why I did decide to change my life course a bit, going from elective life in Massachusetts and thinking of running for office again to basically giving up campaigning for myself and trying to campaign for basic fairness, 
for a, a part of the American family that unfortunately under today's laws does not have it. I know when uh, some folks hear about the log cabin Republicans and hear uh, the notion of being gay and Republican, there's all sorts of questions that come up. And my friends are famous for telling me that, that uh, if they were to write a book or a statement about me, some, some of them claim if they could write the, uh, what would be on my tombstone, um, that it would have the words contradiction in terms. That I represent, that I should, uh, there should be a picture of me in the, in the dictionary um, and, and when it comes to the word contradiction. I'm Republican and I'm from Massachusetts, Kennedy country, now Kerry country. I'm Catholic, born, baptized, educated, taught confirmation, I care about the Catholic Church and I'm gay. I'm gay and I have absolutely no fashion sense whatsoever. People have to tell me what tie, my staff hands me my tie and um, they say I need queer eye for the queer guy. Which, and so I have that contradiction in my life. I'm gay and Republican um, and probably my worst and biggest issue, I absolutely am a baseball addict and I'm a Red Sox fan. So I have more issues than almost any of you, probably the entire group combined. And so when you're having a bad day, try to pretend be, just being me just for a few minutes and trying to make sense out of it. In a lot of ways, um, I have found a level of inspiration and energy and dedication from attempting to stay within institutions that I love and care about uh, and helping change them even if they weren't perfect. Other people find energy and purpose by leaving institutions and speaking out against them when they aren't perfect. And I respect that other people have chosen a different path in their personal, in their family, and in their political lives. But I have found um, some success, always great interest and great struggle, and I think in the end, uh, a place where I could make a difference in my own life. I remember um, being in my early 20s, and at some point, um, I think when I turned 21, I decided that closets were for clothes and not people, and that I wanted to come out of my own. It's kind of a long journey. When I was growing up, I didn't know anyone who was gay. I never saw anyone on TV who was gay. Um, I didn't know a public official who was gay. There were no TV shows. There just wasn't anyone who even could define what that meant. I didn't even know what it meant. Um, but I certainly knew there was something about my life that I couldn't quite figure out. And I finally did. And I remember growing up in Democratic Massachusetts um, then, also knowing that I was kind of conservative as well, and all of it didn't seem to fit together. And I remember sitting down with my, my father, an Italian immigrant, Democrat, union guy, really tough, tough-nosed man. And I sat down with him, and I said, Dad, I need to tell you something. I had met the first person that I really cared about, and I didn't want to have a secret life. I loved my family so much. Sat down in my living room. I, can, I get nervous even talking about it. Um, I said, Dad, I need to tell you something. Um, I want you to know that I'm gay. And my father did the most beautiful thing a dad can do. He just reached out, put his hand on my shoulder, and said, son, I love you. Let's go watch the Red Sox game. Pretty cool. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget my dad for doing that. A couple weeks later, I sat down in the same living room with my dad looked at him again in the same chair that he was in. Dad, I, need, I have to tell you one more thing. Um, I'm Republican. And my father's been in therapy for 15 <laughs> years. Uh, but he's doing well. Uh, he can now talk on occasion, and he has recovered a bit. He came out of the fetal position in about 10 years. And, um, but he's dealing with me being a Republican, and I, I thank him for that um, during these amazing days. I've had a pretty amazing personal journey my office um, that just created that tape is embarrassed by, by laying it out for you and, um, over the course of the last 15 years. And was that, I knew I was conservative and wanted to be a Republican. It was actually Bill Weld who kind of formalized it in my own life. At that point, he was, uh, Bill Weld was uh, running for governor against uh, that guy from that other university, um, John Silber, the president of Boston University, as you know. Um, and I, being always on the BC side of things, was instantly against Silver anyway, because I don't like Boston University, or didn't like. I, I take that back. You can tell I might run for office again. Um, but uh, I remember Bill Weld running, and he was running as a fiscally conservative man, who also was running as someone who said government should stay out of people's personal lives. 
In his case, he was pro-choice, he was pro-gay rights. He basically felt that those were individual decisions uh, people should make. John Silver was running a liberal campaign on economic and other issues and running a very, very conservative campaign when it came to um, issues of, of choice and issues of gay rights. Sadly, some of us knew at the time, and it is public now, so I'm not disclosing anything, John Silver had a gay son who at that point was dying of AIDS uh, during that campaign. And obviously it was a man who was struggling with those issues. But Bill Weld decided that there was a place and a home for people who were libertarian on social issues, inclusive, but also really conservative on a whole series of other issues impacting government. And he actually asked me uh, if I would consider uh, running for the state legislature. In 1993, at the age of 25, I still was doing around this campus a bit. I thought it was kind of funny to think I could even run for the state legislature. There was a resignation in my district. Um, a scandal had occurred, and um, there was an open seat, and the election was going to be in three months, and I decided to give it a shot and was fortunate enough to be able to win. I've been a state rep. I've been blessed enough by my own community to be elected mayor of my great city of Melrose. I've worked uh, with uh, the last four Republican governors, and they've all been interesting people. I've had my agreements and disagreements with them, but I've been proud to kind of walk with them and through so many complex issues. Probably the most memorable was being in the office of Governor Jane Swift uh, on September 11th, when we, when Boston was such a uh, part of such a horrific day in the nation's history. And being on the front lines of watching that unfold at the center of the storm is something that I'll never forget in my life. And then only a few, about 15 months ago, being asked to join the Log Cabin Republicans as their executive director. And uh, I said no three times. I'd never been involved really in gay activism. I had uh, supported legislation when I was in the Massachusetts House uh, for domestic partnership legislation and other important issues. But I always identified more with uh, filling potholes and passing legislation and cutting taxes and all those issues that impact families. And folks said to me, you know, you should consider doing this. And I, again, said no three times. And then something in my, my heart, my gut, told me you ought to do it. There's some reason why you ought to do it. And I remember reflecting with myself and my family and with my God. And something said, uh, if you're ever going to do this in life, this is the moment. I had no idea what I was in for. Fifteen months ago, the nation was not talking about gay marriage. The nation wasn't, civil unions was a radical notion except for some place in Vermont. We weren't talking about amending the Constitution. Um, mayors weren't on their own just hand, get, granting license, marriage licenses to people. And uh, almost since the moment I said yet, yes to this uh, new task and this new challenge, we've seen the nation in what really is an unexpected culture war. One we knew was coming but had no idea how intense. And if we had sat in this room 15 months ago and said, how could we make the issue of civil rights and fairness for gay and lesbian families like the center of the storm in the country, we couldn't even have made up all the little pieces of it that have led to the discussion today. And in a weird way, in the middle of the storm, one of the toughest places to be is to be a gay Republican leading the log cabin Republicans. And now I know why my heart, my soul, my family and ultimately, I think my God said, um, Patrick, this is a challenge. Accept the challenge. I wake up each day, and my staff knows to do this. I ask them to put the pile of hate mail I get into two piles. It's so big. But on one side, the left, is hate mail from the left. People just uh, saying some pretty intense and raw things to me from the left. And I brought... I saw two today that I kept in my file. Um, here's one from a Democrat in Los Angeles. You and people like you are the worst enemies of the gay community. I have no respect for you whatsoever. I think you are a very sad person. I hope you get into some kind of therapy very soon. And most importantly, I hope you lose every election you ever run for within the Republican Party. And he closes with a bang. I think you're just another self-hating faggot. I want to thank William Terrell of Los Angeles for that nice email that he chose to send me. Um, the, when you wake up in the morning and you see that kind of language, you have to do a gut check 
um, before you've had your second cup of coffee. This one actually came in only a couple of hours ago. Uh, my one wish for each and all of you at Log Cabin Republicans is that you wind up exactly like Matthew Shepard. Matthew Shepard, as I think most of you know, is a boy who was brutally killed and tortured because of his sexual orientation. No one deserves to be bashed to death more than all of you. May you rot in the west wing of hell. I didn't even know there was a west wing um, in hell, but I now know that I will be rotting there if that person has uh, his or her say. And I am amazed when I read the letters from the left people who claim to be tolerant and open-minded and question why the nation isn't, that they spend their times attacking individuals like myself and other men and women, gay and straight, who are trying to speak up within one of the major political parties in America. And I wonder whether people on the left would say to people like me who believe in low taxes, who believe in an aggressive war on terrorism, who believe in being tough on crime, who believe in free trade, who believe in all the things that are outlined in the kind of basic game plan of the Republican Party, that I should give up all of those positions, even if this, these other people disagree with me, I should give up all of those principles and beliefs and conservatism simply because of my sexual orientation. Almost as if when I'm born, and if I am gay or lesbian, that the you know, city and town clerk should automatically hand me a Democratic registration and say, for the rest of your life, you will only vote Democratic. And that's what people on the left regularly say, and they say it in uh, some ferocious language, as I just shared with you. And I look back in the history books at some of the most amazing and moving moments in American history regarding expanding civil liberties. If you look at the women's suffrage movement, if you look at the movement for civil rights for African Americans, if you look at the struggle for interracial marriage, if you look at the American with Disabilities Act, one thing you'll see in all of the legislative attempts combined with court action is that you combined Democrats and Republicans in order to pass that level of uh, legislation. There is no way in America we will ever see civil rights for all groups in this nation unless Republicans move over and help support it. And so I always say to my friends on the left, Democrats who are doing really good work in the Democratic Party, we will have this fight for the next 50 years if people like that who are involved in my organization just go out of business. The only way you can win a majority of votes in the United States Congress is to find Republican allies, and we're doing that one person at a time. And so in the end, I do believe it's going to take two parties that become inclusive because it's the right thing to do and because people come out to them. And what Democrats did and uh, have done so well over the last 20 years is they sat down with their legislators, they told them they were gay or lesbian, they said they believed in them, they wrote them checks to their campaigns, they held signs for them, and over time, the Democratic Party somewhat changed, building a lot of allies to help us. When we only work within one political party, and the LGBT community has done that, I think, too much and for too long, we get taken for granted. Now, the president who is probably most remembered for bringing these issues out in a public forum is Bill Clinton. And he deserves credit for using the words, talking about these issues. Yet, when Bill Clinton was president of the United States, he signed the two pieces of federal legislation that explicitly discriminate against gay and lesbian Americans. Our best friend, the person who brought these issues to the national spotlight, the person who was willing to, in State of the Union speeches, talk about gay and lesbian Americans and hate crimes and those issues, he signed the Defense of Marriage Act that denied federal benefits to gay and lesbian families. He signed the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy that almost everybody agrees is not working well, with thousands and thousands and thousands of men and women being thrown out of the nation's armed forces, including scores, dozens of linguists and Arabic prior to September 11th and after it, saying they couldn't serve the nation. They couldn't interpret Al-Qaeda's signals to each other because of their sexual orientation. And so in a weird way, I say to my friends on the left and Democrats, and I know there are some in the room who I've met, 
that we have work to do on both sides of the political, political aisle and that every minute spent attacking people for being Republicans should be used to help move some conservative Democrats who aren't on our side. And maybe we can come to a place where they, we can at least respect each other, that there's a role for both gay and lesbian Americans in both political parties and our allies to work within those parties. Then on my right side of my desk is the letters from the far right. And they're wonderful. They're usually written as if uh, God wrote them. Um, thankfully, I read the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and not all the other people who claim to know exactly what God was uh, talking about. Um, they usually have to go into Leviticus to explain to me how the Bible is all about gay people being sinful, you know, which also means people who eat shellfish are sinful, and we should send all our daughters into slavery. And if you, I mean, all sorts of bizarre things that Le Leviticus, I would have loved to meet the gentleman, um, decided to tell us are always referred to by Gary Bauer and Jerry Falwell and used against us in a religious sense. And I remember explicitly on one of the first days after the governor asked me to run for lieutenant governor, she handed me a letter sent from one of my constituents in Melrose. Dear Governor Swift, I was extremely disappointed and shocked to learn that you have chosen an openly avowed homosexual as your candidate for lieutenant governor. Think of the bad example this shows to our young people. While Mr. Guerrero may not be a homosexual activist himself, the fact that a homosexual would be holding such a high office and be favorably regarded by our governor would be a boon to the activists and give encouragement to them in their efforts to corrupt our youth. This gentleman, who will remain nameless, is also the person who called me and made sure that his street was plowed, that the potholes were always fixed, um, co you know, complimented me for being uh, around the clock mayor seven days a week. Yet, in a moment where the governor reached out to me um, in running for lieutenant governor, he took the time to pen this letter suggesting that uh, she had made a very moral and unethical decision and that somehow um, having me in public would corrupt a generation of young people in the state of Massachusetts. Those kind of messages, as you can imagine, are somewhat difficult to hear, but I have kind of built a personal armor around myself and almost take pride in some of it. And I spend a lot of time with people from the far right, uh, folks who have strong religious conviction. And I think two things um, stick out most. One, the folks who seem to be the most harsh and most use the most painful language, and folks that I have trouble even conversing with in a logical way, believe that a person's sexual orientation is a choice. That I woke up one day and decided what color tie I will wear, what I want for breakfast, who I'm going to root for in a baseball game, and then say, okay, today I think I'll pick being gay. I usually say to those people, well, when did you pick being straight? Do you remember which day of the week it was? Do you remember how old you were? You know, certainly, and I've traveled the nation and talked to people gay and straight all across the country. I have yet to find someone who said they remember that day they just picked their sexual orientation. Yet there is at least a third of Americans who believe, and sometimes in some polls show even a half, who believe it's a lifestyle choice. If it is, then you can understand why intellectually you would go from that position and say, well, we don't need to, you know, Patrick has a choice to get married to a woman. Patrick has a choice to do something else. And so you can see why choice as an issue becomes a fundamental determining factor in where people stand on these issues, whether they're a Democrat or Republican. The second thing that amazes me when I have my discussions with folks, and I like to do it because I think once we change the hearts and minds of conservative Americans, the whole, this whole argument will be over with, is that I am amazed when they tell me that the agenda that I talk about, even though they talk about it more than I do, um, is a radical agenda. They use it all the time. They use it in every interview when I'm on television. It's always Mr. Guerrero is a radical activist, which just kind of cracks me up. Um, because when I look at the civil rights movement for gay and lesbian Americans, I believe we are fighting one of the most conservative movements ever uh, in the history of the country. I am basically fighting one for the right to be boring. I want to have a family. I'd like to have a date first, but I, I, I would like to have a family. 
I would like to have a life partner. I'd like to be in a stable, loving, conservative relationship. I'd like to fight over who's going to take out the trash, who spent too much. I'd like to fight over, I'm fighting a lot tonight. Um, I'd like to discuss what's left in the bank account and where we want to live. Um, is there anything radical about wanting to be born, about having a stable, loving, lifelong relationship, about making sure the government doesn't have to take care of me when I'm sick if I have a partner, um, to show stability and compassion and integrity in this relationship? That is wonderfully conservative. And conservatives, real conservatives, should be challenging a part of the American family to be in loving, committed, monogamous relationships. So we're fighting, A, for our family. Second issue that we're fighting for is to serve in our nation's armed forces openly, without lying. I have friends who are serving tonight in Afghanistan and in Baghdad. They're good Americans. They're loyal soldiers. They love American freedom, and they're fighting for freedom for the people in the Middle East. When they filled out their forms that said, in the event you are blown up, and some of them have watched their friends blow up, in the event you're blown up, who do we notify? They had a lie. Imagine sending your own sons and daughters, the most courageous Americans you can find, onto a battlefield and having them lie to their command commanders. Meanwhile, many of these troops are being are part of uh, battalions and, and groups that are being monitored and managed by the British Armed Forces, which are open. So we have openly gay British commanders watching over American Armed Forces, fighting side by side with them. Yet our soldiers can't even in that form, discreetly say, my partner name is Brian. Or my partner of t 10 years name is Lisa. And please, in the event, the most heroic thing happens to me, that I put my life in the line of duty for my country and my nation, this is the person you should acknowledge and recognize. You can't do that in America. Over 80% of the American people support and armed forces that simply let people be honest with their government. And we should work to a day where we can do that. Amazingly, after spending years of pushing out thousands and thousands and thousands of men and women using all that tax money for investigation, guess when they stop doing it? Right now. All of a sudden, the government has nearly stopped letting people go. Why? Because they need men and women, to serve in Iraq. And what they are discovering is that when it comes to protecting the person you're next to in a foxhole, when it comes to trying to defend freedom for the peace-loving people in Iraq, it doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is at all. And all the issues you could come up with against this argument go away in the midst of war. And that's why you're seeing the number drop to almost zero. And so to the far right that says it's radical for me to want a stable, loving, monogamous family and it's radical for my friends to serve our nation in the armed forces and doing it honestly. And third, not in my church, the Catholic Church, but in other churches that have chosen within their religious communities to be open and inclusive. Some folks want to be bishops in the Episcopal Church. Other people want to have important lay roles uh, as a part of their religious communities. And there's a lot of controversy around that issue. And I know the Catholic Church is working its way through that complex issue. So when you sum up the radical agenda, as talked about by my enemies, it's about having a family, serving the nation, and finding a home and spiritual community so you can be one with your God and your friends and families in a place of worship. There's nothing radical about any of that. And I've tried to challenge some of my friends in the evangelical movement and the far-right movement, that they are actually, in some ways, arguing against their own selves. And that's not an easy thing to say. Let me close with two things and then hopefully take a few questions. Log Cabin Republicans started 27 years ago as a result of uh, a ballot question that came up in the state of California, a state that is very famous for ballot questions, as you know. 
This ballot question, unlike the election of Go Governor Schwarzenegger, is something Log Cabin members, before we even were a formal group, had to oppose. It was a ballot question that would have said, if any public school teacher in the state of California is found to be gay or lesbian, they will be fired immediately. This was going to be about, this was a ballot question. So a group of conservative Americans, some gay, some straight, were sitting in a home and decided, if we don't speak out now, and this ballot question passes, this is a question that will then start spreading all across the country, as often happens when ballot questions pass in California. So this group of, and imagine what it was like in the 70s trying to come out, particularly as conservatives. This group decided to quietly, without a lot of fanfare, go meet with the then governor of California, a guy you might recognize, Ronald Reagan. And they said to Ronald Reagan, then Governor Reagan, um, Governor, this is not fair. This will really turn back the clock on basic people's dignity. It will actually help students control a classroom because they can claim someone's gay on a bad day. And you should come out against it. And guess what? He did. Ronald Reagan, conservative, Republican, governor of California, soon to be president of the United States, came out and said, this question is the wrong way to go. It's not American. And the ballot question lost and never was repeated anywhere else in America in the form that it was presented. And in an odd way, 27 years later, log cabin Republicans find themselves in this very weird place. We're in the midst of this great national debate about civil unions and gay marriage. We find even our president, the president of our party, making a statement about supporting a constitutional amendment. A constitutional amendment, as some of you know, that would not only define marriage, but also would jeopardize civil unions and also would jeopardize certain domestic partnership legislation. And so we find ourselves in that weird quagmire. Folks went to Ronald Reagan. I had the obligation and the privilege of speaking with our president, President Bush, about this. And I thank the president over the holiday season in the White House for uniting the nation in the war on terrorism. And I thank the first lady who he was with for her steady leadership as First Lady and how proud we were to have her in the White House. And then I asked the President, to please don't divide the nation around an effort to amend the Constitution. And so as you imagine, I have a lot of agony about having failed in that mission and having failed in my lobbying efforts with people all around the White House and in the campaign. And there are moments that I get angry when I see Britney Spears go out and have seven or eight cocktails and marry her best friend for 48 hours and have more rights than I do, and more rights than uh, during her 48-hour marriage than a couple that I spent some time with this weekend who've been, been together for 52 years. 52 years, stood by each other, visited the hospital to be with their partner, took care of their community, generated the, to their local library, gave back to their chamber of commerce, supported Republican candidates. How do I look at a 52-year couple, now in their late 80s, and say to them, you deserve to be treated differently. You deserve to have your inheritance be doubly taxed. You deserve to have that awkward thing when you go to a hospital when asking if you could go in to see your partner. I just can't. And that's why log cabin Republicans, while we only support Republican candidates um, who are inclusive, has shifted all of its resources to doing one thing right now, which is trying to make sure the country, in the midst of this great national debate, takes a little bit of breathing room and spends a few years trying to figure this all out so that we don't end up with a messy constitution and with language in it for the first time since the Bill of Rights using language that would deny a part of the American family something the rest has. And it's been a sensitive one. We've tried to do it in a way that wouldn't be insulting to the president in the midst of a presidential campaign. We're not looking to hurt or help anyone in this regard. We simply want to make a conservative case. And I think, Max, they give you a brief tape. Before we go to questions, this is the launching of that television ad campaign um, that's trying to make a conservative argument against amending the nation's constitution.
NBC News World Headquarters in New York. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. This is today in South Point 6 News at 6. And good morning, America. This morning, a first look at new TV ads paid for by the Log Cabin Republicans. The Log Cabin like Republicans, the largest gay Republican advocacy group in the country, launched a million-dollar TV ad campaign. Dear Patrick Guerrero, let me ask you about the Log Cabin. You're, uh, Live from Washington, Judy Woodruff's Inside Politics. President Bush's call for a constitutional amendment prohibiting same-sex marriage is coming under fire by an organization of gay Republicans. We will not remain silent if gay and lesbian families are used as wedge issues in this presidential election. I care too much about the GOP to remain silent on this issue. I'm standing here today because the Republican Party I've devoted so much time to helping build is headed down the wrong path. If we're to prevent the meaning of marriage from being changed forever, our nation must enact a constitutional amendment to protect marriage in America. I really think history is going to look back on this moment and ask what did gay and lesbian conservatives do when the Constitution was threatened to be amended. But good conservatives don't play politics with the Constitution in the midst of an election year. It's a very sacred document. It's a pretty sad day in Washington when principled conservatives are trying to tell states and citizens what to do. The amendment before Congress would not only define marriage and deny that for gay and lesbian Americans. It also would jeopardize civil unions and jeopardize domestic partnership legislation. It will discriminate against gay and lesbian families for generations to come. And it will damage the meaning of liberty in our free society. We've got to stop this amendment now. It's not conservative, and it's certainly not compassionate. The issue isn't marriage. The issue is our sacred constitution. Good conservatives shouldn't tinker with the American constitution. This is a really critical moment for the country and the Republican Party. We want our party to be on the right side of history. Loyalty does not mean checking one's principles at the door. Part of being loyal is speaking out when your party and even your president are going in the wrong direction. Thousands of log cabin Republicans and our allies across America are ready to fight back. Fight back in defense of freedom, in defense of equality, and in defense of fairness. The fight to defeat the Federal Marriage Amendment will be joined by Republicans from across our nation, conservative and moderate, gay and straight, black and white, rich and poor. Today, we're making our voices heard in defense of freedom and fairness. We have launched this unprecedented campaign effort because the exclusion and discrimination embodied in the proposed constitutional amendment violates the principles upon which the Republican Party was founded. We believe, though, that we're saving the party from the radical right. The Log Cabin Republicans. A group of Republicans make an ad opposing a million-dollar campaign against the Republican the group known as the Log Cabin Republicans is launching an ad campaign highlighting comments. The television ad, which features Cheney and images of the civil rights struggle, is the first ad in the organization's 27-year history. It will run in seven key battleground states. Way, the best ad, let me just say, is an ad being run by the Log Cabin Republicans showing Vice President Cheney uh, explaining why he believes states should decide whether or not gay marriage is legal. It's a very effective app. The uh, fact of the matter is we live in a free society and, and freedom means freedom for everybody. We don't get to choose and shouldn't be able to choose and say you get to live free but you don't. People should be free to enter into any kind of relationship they want to enter into. The matter is regulated by the states. Uh, I think different states are likely to come to different conclusions, and that's appropriate. I don't think there should necessarily be a federal policy in this area. Mr. Guerrero, first of all, thanks for coming. And I'd like to uh, commend you for your bravery in the face of those, um, which I found like, very appalling, like letters. Um, my question is, you know, you're very, you're a very devout Republican. You're also devout when it comes to like, gay issues. And like in the final analysis, what, like, if you have to choose between your Republicanism and that, like, like what, how do you decide? Yeah, we actually, we j I just came back from. Uh Palm Springs, California, where we had all log cabin leaders from around the nation. There was 350 of them who are 
uh, working in cities town, and towns across the country. And usually, we talked a lot about that question. And for most everyone there, there was a threshold. They understood the Republican candidates didn't have to be perfect. Maybe even on paper, didn't even have to be as good as a Democratic person. But at some point, that candidate needed to make a statement about being willing to listen and learn and couldn't explicitly uh, be making statements or aggressive actions that would actually hurt that civil rights movement. So that's usually the thresh threshold. And um, that's one I use personally. Um, it's why this election cycle is going to be so difficult for a lot of uh, gay conservatives. Um, I will note something, though, which people forget about, is that while the president has come out and supported a constitutional amendment in Washington, D.C., that Senator John Kerry um, came out in favor of the constitutional amendment in Massachusetts, that vote was five votes. There were a lot of Democrats and Republicans. And let's remember, the Massachusetts legislature has 170 Democrats and 30 Republicans. And so Democrats, with the support of Senator Kerry, sadly, and these are my former colleagues, voted to amend the, most, the nation's oldest state constitution in a way that would disallow gay and lesbian Americans for having to have the same civil rights. And so I guess um, we use a threshold. There are parts of the country where there are certain candidates who don't get our support at all. Any money that we have in our political action committee only goes to candidates who are on record uh, supporting us on a series of issues. And in this particular race, which is really tough for us, and tough for me a little bit, because. Senator Kerry and I are not very good friends. We've campaigned against each other for the last 15 years. Um, instead of using our money uh, to be able to help more and more Republican candidates, and there are a lot of good ones around the country who we work with, um, we've had to use a lot of our resources to try to defend the Constitution. And so we're up on television in a bunch of states trying to prevent that vote. So it's a, your question is one that uh, hits home for a lot of, uh, of our organization right now. And we try to do it thoughtfully and pick and choose. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Hi. Hello again. Uh, my name is Christy Slavik. I'm a member of Allies. Um, there seems to be a wide chasm between large metro metropolitan centers and rural areas in terms of political atmosphere. How does this dichotomy affect your strategy of promoting, in promoting the log cabin Republicans' message across the United States? With the question, I think. Most of you were able to hear is the dichotomy between uh, urban areas and rural areas and how that impacts Log Cabin's mission. It's interesting. Since we launched this TV ad, because this is the first time in 27 years we've done TV all across the country, the biggest rush of people contacting our office and wanting to start chapters are in rural communities and in states that you wouldn't think of usually. Because what happened during the uh, late 60s, and 70s, and 80s, a very sad thing happened, which I think conservatives should be upset with, that as people discovered their sexual orientation, they abandoned their family, they abandoned their home, and they went to ghettos to find safety and find a place where they could be themselves. What you ended up with back home is, particularly in the South and in, in places in the Midwest and some smaller rural places, nobody in the community was coming out to their family. And so you see this huge difference of opinion between major American cities and suburbs sometimes just 30 miles away from them. The fundamental way to change the American people and the way to change pockets um, geographically in the country is to have somebody come out to someone in a family. And the reason this civil rights movement is moving 1,000 miles an hour and I believe will be largely over with within the next 10 years is that there are very few American families that can have a Thanksgiving dinner who don't either know somebody who's out or think someone is gay. And as that number just grows, as, as each family tree recognizes that somewhere in the landscape of their own beautiful and diverse family there's someone who probably is gay or lesbian, all of a sudden your position on some basic civil rights issues change immediately. There was a gentleman who I think is one of the heroes of the year in the civil rights movement who probably won't get any credit, was an evangelical Christian Republican from Michigan. There was a vote a couple of weeks ago in Michigan about a constitutional amendment uh, banning gay marriage and civil unions. And this gentleman, the person least expected to vote against a constitutional amendment, was one of the only Republicans, if not the only Republican, to do so. And people were shocked. He actually was picketed 
and there were flyers put on cars at his local parish when he did it. And he said to folks, as an older gentleman, he said, I was on the wrong side of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s, and I'd, I've had trouble looking at my God because I know that I had discriminated against a part of God's family, the American family. And he goes, what my best friend growing up came out to me a bunch of years ago. This is a person who stood by me as a friend. I've watched him struggle through his family life. I've watched him struggle to accept who he is. And after seeing that, he said, um, I could not in, in good judgment, even though I'm an evangelical conservative Christian, I could not vote to write this language in the Constitution. We ought to take our time with this. And so I think the challenge will be as people start talking honestly about each other um, and we embrace everybody, um, we'll be in a place in America where that doesn't happen. And every poll, we just did a national poll of the country. The moment someone says, I know someone in my life who is, they change positions. It doesn't matter whether they are evangelical or if they are liberal. They work, work their way through there, and it sometimes take a bu takes a bunch of years. But that, I think, is a fundamental difference. Hi, Mr. Gore, I just wanted to uh, thank you for... I just wanted to um, thank you for sharing that story. That's was very nice. Um, uh, my name is Brian. I'm a sophomore, and um, being gay and being Catholic is something that I've had to reconcile in my own life, and um, Catholicism is such a huge part of my life, and um, um, my moral behavior, and just living my life through God, my activities, um, even in my academics and the classes I choose. Um, and for me, this lecture has been very enlightening in the fact that um, I can see that you one can be gay and Republican and Catholic, all those things. How have you come to reconcile all those three, all of those three conflicting things, which for me were very difficult, um, you know, as a Democrat, that I didn't have that political aspect to reconcile with. So maybe you could talk about that. It's, it's hard, and there's days that I'm very challenged. Uh, I was just uh, Andrew Sullivan, a great Catholic conservative gay writer. Uh, I gave a speech this weekend, which was really moving, that talked about his own personal struggle with his spirituality, his church, and all of this. Um, for me, it's all about personal dignity. Um, what really moves me is that I remember growing up, I remember being 15 years old, and I remember being in my own room, um, in the fetal position, tears coming down my face, and I, I and day after day for a per that little period in my life where I wondered whether I could look God, look at God, and that he would care about me, whether I could ever look at my own family and tell them about my life, and that they would still love me as a conservative. That was like not even, I wasn't even going to go there. I had enough issues. But I remember the pain of all of that. And I remember what a waste of time it was. Every minute I was doing that could have been done doing something for the senior citizen who lived next to me or giving back to my community. And my determination about staying within the institutions, the Republican Party, the Catholic Church, even my own family, who were not perfect when I came out, was that I care so much about them and the values I stand for and the self-dignity I have needed to be matched with a commitment to those institutions and those people. And um, it's not easy. I know internally that in the end, this basic movement about fairness is something that is on the right side of history. And so when I get a death threat or when I get the hate mail every morning or when someone attacks me in a social setting, or when someone questions whether I'm a sad person or need therapy. There's a part of me that believes that what I'm trying to do and a lot of other people are trying to do is going to make sure that there will be a day in America where a 15-year-old anywhere in the country will not be in the fetal position in their room wondering if their family, their church, or their community loves them. It's the one thing that keeps me going. And Probably one of the most emotional days in the last couple months, and it's been, a, it's been a very intense time, as you can imagine, for me, but most of it is just about good, heavy political energy and, um, and a good battle that, that we're willing to wage was when I woke up to the news that a county in Tennessee had cast a vote basically saying that gay and lesbians weren't uh, welcome in the county. And I, what I did that morning was think of myself as a 15-year-old reading the newspaper and wondered what that would have done to me if I read that. Um, so it's that commitment uh, to stay within institutions and change it for the next generation of people that keeps me doing this. 
I also know, for instance, with the church, I mean, we're here on a Catholic campus, Boston College. I give them credit for finally recognizing allies after I know a difficult process. This campus is making tremendous progress from where it was when I was a graduate student. Um, there are a lot of people, both lay and uh, religious, that I've met through the course of my life who have been among the most tolerant and open-minded people. I've had my disagreements with um, the Vatican, but they're, they've historically been fairly slow on some things. Um, I've had some disagreements with Cardinal Law, who you know well, and now you own his home. Um, <laughs> so all your student fees are going up <laughs> by a couple thousand. I, no, I didn't say that. Um, that will be cut from the university ar archives now. Um, I'll, actually, I'll tell a story that I haven't, I don't know that I've ever told before, which was I knew Cardinal Law because I was a, the student body president at Catholic University of America. Cardinal Law was on the board of trustees, and I was a student person on the board of trustees. And I got to spend time walking with the Cardinal on several occasions. We talked about the challenges for young people. At that point, I wasn't talking about my sexual orientation. Uh, but I found him to be a compassionate man. He listened. Um, he offered to pray for me. He asked me to be a priest. Um, and I went to Cardinal Law's mother's funeral. Um, saw him on a lot of occasions. And then I saw the difficulty that the archdiocese has experienced because of some mistakes, very, very serious and severe mistakes the cardinal made and others made. But I remember when the morning that the governor asked me to run for lieutenant governor, I did what I thought was a courteous thing to do as a Catholic, which was I called the cardinal. Um, he wasn't available at the time, but I got a message to him, and I, I want cardinal, I wanted him to know that I was going to, there would be an announcement that morning, and that I wanted him to know and that I would be as respectful as I could to the church uh, be, even though I have some different politi political positions on issues and that I asked him for the same and then asked if he would pray for me. And um, a few days later, Cardinal Law attended the State of the Union uh, speech, uh, State of the State speech by Governor Swift. I was in the front row sitting next to Mayor Menino, and the Cardinal walked in, and there certainly was a tension in the room, people wondering what the interaction between myself and Cardinal Law would be. Um, and he had had a really bad day that day in the paper. Some other heavy-duty stuff had come out. And I remember doing something I never would have imagined as a student at Catholic University. I went up to the Cardinal in the midst of this incredible moment in my own life, and everyone worrying about, you know, is someone going to say something negative about Patrick's sexual orientation? I walked up to the Cardinal and said, Cardinal Law, it's good to see you. I'm praying for you during these difficult days. And all of a sudden, it really didn't matter. Here was a young person running for lieutenant governor who happened to be gay, feeling the pain of a cardinal who was dealing with such great tragedy and dealing with the great mistakes that he had made and the church had made. And um, it's a weird thing sometimes. But in the end, I think the church, while it may take longer than almost any other institution, will discover that um, in a lot of ways um, it needs to be a welcoming home to every single one person created by God. And that's why I think in the end we'll, we, the church will be a, a place that is, uh, can be home to a lot of folks but I understand the anger and why it causes some people to leave. I think we have time for a few more questions, if, please. Hey, Mr. Guerrero, my name is Hal Mackins. I'm a senior here. I'm the editor of The Observer, which is a conservative uh, newspaper on campus. And like Max and yourself, I'm also a BCI grad. So, well done. Um, I was just curious, from the view of your congressional as a lobbyist, how worried are you about the FMA? Do you, do you think that it has legislative legs, or do you think that it's something that President Bush has done to placate the far right? And what would black cabin Republicans do if it were to come to pass? Right. Um, I actually am more fearful of the FMA than most other people are in the country. We've been really pleased. There have been a ton of conservatives across America who have come out against it over the last few weeks. Um, David Dreyer in California and Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Pataki, a whole lot of people in the middle who said basically a lot of U.S. senators no one expected. Because, you know, good conservatives don't change the nation's founding document unless it's really serious business. And in this case, even if you don't support, and I assume there's people in this room who don't support gay marriage, we have a federal law on the books, the Defense of Marriage Act, that says marriage is something between a man and a woman. There's not a single court case in America that uh, questions that. There's no way this U.S. Supreme Court, under the current makeup, that barely could even pass the sodomy law, which is simply being allowed to be in the privacy of your own home with somebody, they could barely pass that, would ever pass 
a right to gay marriage right now. And so this was really, I believe, a rush to judgment to placate the far right, as you said, in the middle of a presidential campaign, which is something we shouldn't put the Constitution in the middle of. Um, but I worry about them changing the language of the FMA, softening it a bit, making it more palatable. And it's a really tough vote. This issue is so new to most Americans. Six months ago, no one was having this discussion. And so there will be a lot of folks in different parts of the country who feel like at this point, the majority opinion would be uh, on the wrong, on the right, on a different side of this issue. And so I actually think the press reports that this is a no-brainer are not true and that this could get close very quickly. The Defense of Marriage Act passed with all, nearly all Republicans and Democrats supporting it. And so um, I'm, I'm nervous about it. Um, even uh, Hillary Clinton hasn't said what she would do if the FMA was changed into a softer amendment, only that the FMA itself is something she wouldn't support. And so we're working very hard. We meet with Democrats and Republicans every day. Senator Gordon Smith, a good man, a very religious man from Oregon, um, was a keynote speaker at our convention this weekend in Palm Springs, California. And what we're finding is a lot of these conservatives, and I meet with them privately, with, I don't do press releases on these meetings, they know this is a national issue. And for so many of them, because uh, so many LGBT Americans don't talk to Republicans, a lot of these folks have never sat in a room with a known, Repo a, a known gay person. So you're sitting in the room and you're basically, they're w asking you the most basic of questions. And so it, it was an extra reminder of why log cabin Republicans exist. We are actually coming out in meetings to the most powerful people in America who want to walk through this issue. They just are uncomfortable with it. You can't expect someone from a state, a small state or a southern state, who's never talked to anyone about these issues to be right on our issues. And so that's part of the mission. Um, so the FMA is serious. We've been putting our ad out in places all across the country where there are senators wavering basically with the green light here saying you can be conservative, you can love America, but you've got to love the Constitution, and you don't have to support the FMA. And we think right now we've got the thing stopped in its tracks for now, but I wouldn't be surprised if on two occasions, one, when licenses uh, become part of our way of life in Massachusetts on May 17th, I bet there will be a push for an amendment or at least new sponsors for it. And then when the Democratic National Convention hits Boston, and people are having wedding ceremonies in Boston with John Kerry as the nominee. My guess is there might be some folks who want to make an issue out of it, and you'll see another push there. And my deal is I think if this election is close or if things aren't going well in other arenas, there will be some conservatives who say we need to use this issue to win in West Virginia or the panhandle of Florida or the conservative areas in Ohio. And so the reason we're doing this ad and in swing states is not to hurt the president or the party, but basically to make a case in those swing states that the 2004 election should be about the war on terrorism and jump-starting the American economy. And which of these two people, John Kerry or George Bush, do you want as your commander-in-chief? And which one do you want to make, want making decisions about how to jump-start the economy when it comes to taxes? As a Republican, I think Bush trumps Kerry on those issues, knowing him here in, in Massachusetts. Um, when it comes to using me or my family as a wedge issue in a campaign, I can't be a loyal Republican and not say something, and that's why we're doing what we are about a constitutional amendment. Hello. You guys are still around, huh? Yeah. You're it. <laughs> And we don't bother to affiliate ourselves with any uh, political affiliation. Sure. Um, the question for you is uh, many Bay State politicians have proposed uh, and kind of, kind of endorsed the Civil Unions Act. Uh, let's stop you short of using the term marriage. Uh, would you accept this form of compromise? Do you think it's important to continue pushing to get the term marriage uh, and have a relevant girl relationships that happen? Sure. I mean, I have always been a, a kind of a, a process person, believing you take baby kind of steps to get things done. And so I think it has been a little bit unfortunate. I support civil marriage, but it has been tough that within just a half a year, we've kind of rushed to this national debate about it because it takes time to walk through all the issues. The reason I don't support civil union um, as, a, as a fair compromise is that under federal law and the nation's laws, which are not going to be changed, um, 
everything from pension to social security to inheritance issues all fall under marriage, uh, civil marriage. And so, for instance, someone who's got a civil union in Vermont right now, um, who passes away, who's been a government employee for 50 years, their partner doesn't get social security benefits, doesn't get pension benefits. If they own a home together, that person has to pay double the taxes that um, another couple would on their home. And so the way we've created the civil license for people to get tax fairness falls under a term that is in every single code and book in Washington. It would take 100 years before Washington would ever change all of those laws. Um, so I think the only reason the nation is struggling with the word is because it's been a, it's, marriage has been a very important institution. It brings, it's part of every family's way of life and history. What I think we need to do is shift from a discussion about um, make, make a distinction between religious marriage and civil licenses. And I believe that intellectually where we will get as a country soon is that both gay and straight couples who want to spend their life together will be granted a civil license, almost like a civil union, using the, that term. And that churches, the Catholic Church will say that we as a church will only recognize straight couples for religious marriage. Once you explain that to people, even when I'm in the South and you walk through a license, I mean, I was a mayor of a city. We had an office that had dog licenses, plumber's licenses, marriage licenses. It was a piece of paper that basically said you're going to be treated a certain way. That had nothing to do with the local church down the street who wanted to have a ceremony. And there's nothing, government should never tell a single church of any kind that it has to accept my relationship. That's a decision for the, the church and its leaders and, its, uh, and the people at that church. So I think that's where we're moving. By accepting civil unions, I think it's, again, historically will, would be a mistake. I believe we're going to look back in 20 years, and we will laugh, and not, not laugh, but we go, what the heck were we having this fight about? When interracial marriage uh, was called on by the court system, 87% of white Americans opposed it. This is within the last 50 years. And I think what you just thought when I said that is going to be what you and I think 30 years from now. When we go back and say, you mean we didn't want to let two people just live their life together and be treated equal under the law and get access to a hospital and have inheritance rights? Why did, what was the problem? And I think the problem is today when people think of a civil marriage license, they think of a church. And they think folks like me are trying to tell a church what to do. And that's not the case. I certainly know even though I would support civil unions as a step, that you would not want to write something into a constitution, either the national constitution or our own state constitution, because that denies us the chance to even debate it in the years ahead. Maybe we'll decide something else, but we don't want to codify it right now because then we'll have a chance to have a healthy debate. Let me say thank you, since I am on this campus and I know Inviting me is, is uh, moderately controversial, but I think it's a credit to the Boston College uh, campus and your leadership here that you invited me, that you welcomed me. You let me say some controversial things in the spirit of academic freedom. Um, I recognize not everyone in this room shares the same opinion about all of these issues, but you gave me a thoughtful platform to do that, and I personally am grateful, particularly because I spent so many days here uh, as a student. Thanks for having me tonight.